Hello and welcome to The Debate, presented jointly in the European Parliament in Brussels by Europol TV and Nova TV from the Balkans. With me, Paul Anderson. And me, Borian Jovanovsky. We'll be discussing the challenges, setbacks, successes, even though sometimes they are hard to see, of the EU's enlargement towards the Western Balkans. The new European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, he said, no new members under his watch, but the process rumbles on anyway. With us in the studio are Ivo Weigel from Slovenia, a Liberal MEP, and Eduard Kukan from Slovakia, who's a member of the European People's Party. A warm welcome to you both. And from the socialist Mitiadis Kirikos, and from the University of Glass, Florian Bieber, who is also the coordinator of the Balkan in Europe Policy Advisory Group project of European Funds for Balkans. OK, let's start off with you, Florian, and, and sort of set the scene because the Balkans isn't often in the news headlines these days. Today we have progress reports from all six aspirant Balkans countries, Serbia, Montenegro, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Bosnia, Kosovo and Albania. If it's possible, can you give us a pencil sketch of what, in your view, the biggest advances are in the uh, accession process and also what the biggest obstacles are? Well, we have two countries which are in talks, Serbia and Montenegro, and that is certainly a big progress, that there is a continuous enlargement process going on and the talks really matter. But then we have about three countries, I would say, which face serious problems. One is Bosnia-Herzegovina for internal problems, political blockades. There were elections recently, and as a result, we don't see much progress towards the European Union and reforms for that matter. We have Kosovo, which has the challenge that is not recognized by five EU member states, and that eventually blocks its members to the EU down the road, um, although there are many other internal problems. It's not had a government for months. Um, and then finally Macedonia as well, which has uh, a name dispute unresolved with Greece and which also c constitutes an obstacle and has resulted in a, I would say, increasingly authoritarian tendency within the country. Uh, and then we have a regional picture, a picture of countries which are um, in many ways see EU moving away from them. And as a result, elites are less and less committed about EU enlargement. You get more and more sound bites, more and more signals saying that they're not that interested in enlargement anymore. And you have a kind of a rise of authoritarianism, um, not you know, dictatorship, but just governments which behave not very democratic, which uh, reduce media freedoms. And that really becomes a problem increasingly. Mm -hmm. uh, let's use the case study of my country, Macedonia. Six recommendation to start the negotiation to, to, for membership, and uh, which are six clear encouragement to reform and to implement the European values. Paradoxically, uh, we see the setback, at, it was uh, said by Commissioner Fule when he presented the progress uh, report. Uh, what's the problem of the EU efforts to, to encourage the process of reform in Macedonia and to implement European values? Mr. Weigel? Well, first of all, we have a serious problem with, uh, with the non-functioning parliament in uh, Macedonia. So I think it is the major obstacle for Macedonia themselves, but also for us who are, who are observing the, how, how the process of rapprochement to the European Union is, is progressing. And uh, uh, of course there are uh, in, also, in the last, uh, last report, there are, there are some shortcomings which have been noticed, uh, in, in, like, uh, like uh, corruption is still there and, uh, and uh, media, uh, ha the journalists have the problem with the media legislation and the practices in the, uh, as, uh, concerning the, the, the work of the journalists then there are, there are still uh, open questions in, uh, concerning the Ohrid uh, agreement, uh, the relations between the nations in, in, within the, with Macedonia. But I would say uh, it is not uh, uh, proper just to talk about the shortcomings. Macedonia has made a great progress concerning economic situation. Uh, very encouraging data about the growth, about, about the employment. The rate of unemployment has, has fallen in the last couple of years from almost 40% to 28%. So 
I, uh, the overall picture of, of, of the country is not as bad as, as it, it looks on the first... Uh, but we are view. talking about the, the, the statement of Mr. Fuller, Mr. Kukan, who said there is an obvious backside of the reform processes. So what's the problem of, to, for EU to encourage this process of reforms, despite of the problem with, for the, with the name issue? I would, I would agree that uh, it must be a, fr a frustrating situ situation for the government and people of uh, Macedonia. The fact that the progress reports for several co consecutive years always said that Macedonia is fulfilling criteria and Commission recommends to the Council to give the date for the beginning of the accession negotiations. European Parliament supports always this resolution and in the as a result, in the conclusions of the uh, Council is that Macedonia is doing uh, how what, what it can and we shall return to this uh, question after six months. How does that square up with the experience and the reality on the ground where people there speak of a more authoritarian, as Florian was pointing out, uh, a more authoritarian tendency where you're looking at <coughs> pressure on media freedoms and on civil society? It's like two different narratives here, is it not? Uh, Yes, I wanted to stress that uh, this situation creates uh, diffic difficulties for the government to, to keep up the flames of uh, integration of Macedonia to the European Union. Under this situation, it, it is really difficult. On the other hand, there are a lot of issues which government of Macedonia can do in delivering the reports, in addressing the issue of freedom of media and all this other things. Bo po political boycott of the parliament. It's a very damaging thing and it's occurring in Macedonia and it also damages the, the general image. But I would tend to agree with Mr. Weigel, with my colleague, that generally Macedonia is not as bad as it is usually portrayed. Okay, let's move on to that name question uh, and, and bring in you, Miltiadis Kirkos. Do you think that the European, it should be the European Union or the member, the member states of the European Union who should act as an honest broker in resolving this issue between Greece and the former Yugoslav uh, Republic of Macedonia, which is what uh, the European Union and uh, the UN describe former Macedonia as? Um, do, do you think it should act as an honest broker rather than let the two countries sort out their problems themselves, which they appear incapable of doing up to this point? Uh, the whole process of the enlargement is to help the states overcome their difficulties and expand the rule of law, the freedom, the fundamental freedoms, and also to create better relations with their neighbors. As we see, the problem of the name is not um, a problem that can be uh, questioned as whether Macedonia is much worse than before or is uh, a bit big better than before. The question of the name is very clear. In my opinion, former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia, as is the official name, must choose a name that uh, makes it very clear that there is no confusion between that part of the world and the neighbor countries. So it must be a joke. Let's say I'm not the one to, to propose names, but the name must be uh, like a geographical but, but that, name but that's the that can be very clear to which part okay, of Europe. Okay, that's the Greek the position. So, but this problem has proved intractable for many, many years. Who is the this problem from going time to, solve to time it? is used because there are so many problems that can be solved, and there are problems that have to work on solving. The problem with the name is very clear with a relation with a European country, with Greece. So, uh, Greece's opinion is that the issue of the name is a European issue about a European country and a neighbour that it is in the process of getting accepted into the Union. We, so, yeah. we, we are totally agree that the place of former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia together with the rest of the West Balkans are in the European Union through a process that Mr. makes these yeah. countries to be uh, in competence with the European laws. Uh, Mr. Kirikos, why not to allow Macedonia to start the negotiation and then 
to give a chance to resolve this problem of the name issue during the process of the negotiation. If and look to, at have the a, to resolve this issue once, just before entry in the European Union. Uh, maybe it will, the process of negotiation as such is going to encourage more the whole process of the of if the I am resolving to agree the, the, with the my colleagues, issue. and as we saw in the Bosnian results, and as we saw in the tensions that erupt in the football grounds, nationalism is running rampart in the Balkans. So I'm not sure that this may be that you told us, maybe this will lead to the correct direction. I, in my opinion, the issue of the name is used as a way of um, getting um, forces between um, getting forces behind a nationalist idea. If there was not that idea, then there wouldn't be any problem of choosing a name. So, taking the name out of the discussion is not the correct way to, to solve problems between neighboring countries. Can I just put that same question to the rest yes, of our panel? I would, you, do, you, I would, do you agree with that? What I would friendly disagree with my colleague. I think that, that it makes absolutely no sense to, to prevent uh, Macedonia to start negotiations. I think the really European uh, uh, solution for the, the stalemate would be to, to come with the new dynamics. And dynamics means uh, start of the negotiation. And I also think that uh, once Macedonia would start the negotiation, the mood in the, the, the country would, would, would change. And they would be more oriented to the future than to the past. So I think uh, this would be the right, the right uh, uh, move. And uh, the, the, the cause of the general frustrations shown by the opinion polls in the la last time, where the people really uh, care less and less for, for the European Union and uh, European future, uh, shows that uh, some new dynamics should be introduced. I, and then uh, lately I would say it is not very, very in the, the sense of, of, of a modern European uh, art of uh, solving the problems, then that we have two countries there just in their, their defense uh, uh, position instead of uh, enter in the pragmatic and, 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 and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, tolerant uh, debate uh, how to solve a, a common problem. Uh, Florian, in the interest of, of time, yes. Uh, let's go to, to Bosnia now. 90 years of the Dayton Agreement and Bosnia is still an open question. The perspective of Bosnia is still not clear. Uh, what's the problem with Bosnia? And again, the leverage of the European Union to resolve the problems. Well, partly it's the institutional setup of Bosnia, which is creating elites which are not accountable in many ways. So elections don't resolve the problem because essentially everybody's in power somewhere in Bosnia. So you can't really throw out politicians as easily and punish them for not governing uh, you well. And we see this, that the elections in October didn't really bring about a whole large-scale change of politics in Bosnia. Um, the other issue is, again, the European Union has been using conditionality too early, too harshly. The sedic Finci case about changing the Bosnian constitution is important, but it was seen as a condition for Bosnia to apply for membership. And this is, I think, a problem. It's similar in the case of the, the, the dispute between Greece and Macedonia. If the hurdles are too high too early on, the motivation of political elites to do reforms isn't there. Mm -hmm. If you feel you're going to join, your country is going to join the European Union in 15 years, when you're long time out of office, what is your motivation to pursue this agenda? Edward Cook, on, sort of, and give us a balance sheet, if, if you will, on the situation in, in Bosnia. As Florian says, we've just had elections, and the situation um, 19 years after Dayton looks very much like it was one day after Dayton. Um, it was hoped that the, um, the, the, the federation and the different different ethnic entities would come together more closely within Bosnia and create a model which was against the way things had been during the, the, the program of ethnic cleansing and during the war. Has that happened at all? Yes, it, didn't, it didn't, didn't work like that, but I want to stress that after the elections, last elections, 
I still think that there is a ray of hope for the country because it's clearly falling back in the process. It's lagging behind all other countries in the region. <coughs> but recently there are several <coughs> meaningful initiatives <coughs> how to correct this. I mean the joint letter of the foreign minister of Germany and the UK which uh, contained some new, very original ideas, how to change the situation and some other initiatives. And now I think they are going to be streamlined into one position of the whole EU. Uh, Friday this week on the 5th of December, Commissioner Hahn and High Rep Mogherini are traveling to Sarajevo. So I think that this is a chance. Now is the chance for the political elite of Bosnia to show that they are interested in the European future of their countries and uh, they, they should use this, this moment because if this moment is lost I don't think nothing, I don't think anything positive for the country can happen. Mr. Uh, Weigel, Mr. Kirkos, we, we see German initiative, it's a German initiative and uh, again the question about the EU credibility. Could we expect that EU could do something as a whole and not a national member states, maybe with the support of United States, to to see the efficiency of the, the diplomatic action? I think that Euro Europe should be more ambitious. European Union should be should uh, try to to come up with uh, with some common plan with some common initiative and I think that uh, uh, High, Com High Com uh, Representative Mugherini is showing uh, this will and, and interest I, and she has the knowledge. Now it is up to how much of initiative the member states and their ministers will allow her and what are the global interests uh, in, on, in, in, on, the, on stake. So, but I think that, and I will stop with saying this, uh, I don't think that the, the Dayton framework allows uh, 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 really uh, to reform, to modernize the, the, the uh, Bosnian Herzegovinian society. I think that after uh, two, uh, uh, 25 years almost of, of, of a new, completely new situation. The people of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina are mature to, to take over the responsibility and also the political elite. Uh, it is a time maybe to, to change the political elite, but it only can be done on democratic elections. But we, we Which we've don't just have had. it in the situation where you have 30 parliaments and, 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 uh, and uh, the country devised and atomized, atomized in, in, in so many entities. It doesn't work. Dayton Agreement was good to stop the war. It is not, uh, it, it is not a framework to build up a modern state. And Mr. Kirkos, if you look at the results of the elections and see the consolidation of the entrenched positions that were first established under Dayton. I mean, what hope do you think there is um, for the future or what pathway out of these elites and out of this existing system do you think exists? I'm not an optimist that um, I can see any way out in uh, Bosnia. The entrenchments, as you refer to them, are very strong and uh, the position there is, um, in my opinion, very, very difficult. That is not the case for the rest of the Western Balkans. I would uh, agree with my colleague in this point, not on the others that we discussed earlier, that uh, Mr. Mrs. Merkel's initiative is on the right direction and Europe must have a unique uh, decision on that. But we must not forget that these countries, as uh, professor explained, are already in a way to the Balkans, either by being mem members to be or in uh, having specific problems to solve beco before becoming members. So it is uh, a process that must be encouraged, but we must be definitely sure there are ways, European ways, there are laws. It's not for being in the European Union, it's for their own good. These countries are not doing uh, are not uh, supporting the freedom of the press because European Union tells them to do so. They are not stopping the boycott of the parliament as it happens the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia because Europe has to tell them so because of their own political interests. And they okay. must solve these problems and then we have so many obstacles to overcome but we will overcome them together. Again, about the EU leverage, let's go to Serbia, Mr. Uh, Bieber. 
What about Serbia? We, we, we so recently uh, opened dilemma in Serbia whether to go towards East or to stay with Europe. The same dilemma was raised in Montenegro recently by the uh, Mr. Djukanovic. We have uh, two countries uh, just started negotiation and they are in the very beginning of this process. They are opening the d dilemma whether to stay with Europe or to go otherwise. What's the problem? Well, I think it's partly a gamble of elites. They're saying, if you don't treat us better, uh, we're going to look to Russia. I don't think Russia is at the moment offering... Treat better means what? I mean, to, you to, have a negotiation process. Right. What, what, what else? Well, I think, of course, the elites personally are worried about this, the Sanader effect, that they might end up in jail at the end of the negotiations. Uh, and the other problem is that um, they think also that the process may be not going fast enough or maybe being too critical in some aspects. I mean, I think the statements like that of Milo Djukanovic and also statements by the Serbian government are suggesting that they want to keep good ties with Russia because that is popular uh, in their countries and to put pressure on the European Union. I don't think Russia is a real alternative in the region. It's not a real player. It can't really have the influence. I mean, let's not forget the Western Balkans are surrounded by the European Union, surrounded by NATO. Um, they are an island in the European Union. But Russia can create trouble if it wants to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it depends on the European Union. I mean, it's, it's a game the European Union has to lose. If the European Union basically says no enlargement or enlargement one day far, far away. Well, then, of course, Russian influence will increase. But it's only at that moment that Russia really has a role to play. And do you see, really, that uh, Russia, you know, it's up to the, the, the Serbs to manage this process themselves, um, and that Russia is just going to stand by back and, and, and watch to see how it evolves? Or is it going to be far more active um, in Serbia and in Montenegro and with the Bosnian Serb Republic? I mean, I think it will be more active there because it has a certain degree of sympathy of parts of the political actors. But again, we saw with South Stream, there's a limitation of what Russia can do um, if it has the opposition of the European Union. And let's not forget, Russia also has good ties to a number of EU member states. So it's not really that it's only uh, in the Western Balkans um, the case. So I would, I would be cautious to overestimate the role of Russia. It depends a lot on what political elites choose and what they think is convenient for their own popularity. Uh, uh, the, the question for the three EMPs. Balkan looks like becoming a battlefield of the Russian and EU interest. Uh, do you agree, Mr. Kukan? No, it's, it's overstatement, but I think there is another issue which should be mentioned in this connection, and it is very bad economic situation of the countries, especially Serbia, when they, they really need uh, some financial uh, assistance in order to deal with the everyday issues. And Russia is ready to do that. We are not. Let's, let's face it. If they ask for some financial assistance, the EU does not have it, and Russia does. So Russia is skillfully using also this moment, and we shouldn't forget it. I agree that Russia is not such a, such a, such a big player, like the uh, professor said, but the countries, I think that I believe the political leadership of Serbia and Montenegro, that they sincerely want to have their countries in the EU. And I think also we should tell them very clearly that to be best friends with Russia and to be best friend, friends with the EU, it's not, sus, not a sustainable policy e and they have to make a choice. Ivo Weigel? Well, I disagree here with my colleague uh, Kukan. Usually we agree, but this time I don't think that, that, that this kind of, uh, uh, of relation to Russia is a, a, a long-term uh, uh, situation in Europe. I think we should come slowly with Russia also to the, to the normal terms. Uh, we should uh, work on the open problems. We should insist that Russia uh, is not allowed to, to, to violate the international law, should, should withdraw from the occupied territories. But in the long term, I don't accept that, 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 that uh, uh, Europe is building a wall against Russia. And I think also that the countries who have had uh, traditional ties to, uh, to Russia for historical, religious and other reasons will keep having this kind of relations also in the future. And this is nothing bad.
And what about on the question of Kosovo? Because if, if we stretch back our memories, it was Russian peacekeepers who barreled their way through Serbia into Kosovo as the first peacekeepers, in effect, um, in Kosovo in uh, 1999 or 2000, I forget exactly which year. Does Russia have a capacity in its potential leverage with the money that Mr. Kukan was saying is potentially available to influence Serbia on the critical Kosovo question? Well, I think La Russia has always li uh, leverage also in the Middle East and elsewhere. It is a superpower and it will stay a superpower. So uh, there, therefore I am against uh, this kind of uh, taking it as, uh, as uh, uh, relations for, forever. Uh, we are now on the, on the critical uh, uh, verge of, of our uh, relations. We should uh, work on it. But Russia will have to, we will need Russia also sometimes when it will be about the serious problems to, to solve. Such and, uh, but I definitely don't believe that, that, that orientation towards Russia might change the pro-European orientation for either of Serbia or Montenegro. They, the public opinion, they might be critical sometimes, but the orientation is towards Europe. They want it and the, the political elites want it. And independently of some statements which are made for, for opportunistic reasons. But, but the pro-European orientation of Western Balkans is clear. It is not to be changed. Uh, the question for a uh, uh direct neighbors of the Western Balkans, northern neighbors Slovenia and southern neighbors, uh, neighbor Greece. What, uh, what, what's your point of view? What, what do you think uh, how Greece and Slovenia use their position to, uh, to spread, to promote European values in, uh, in the Western Balkans? Well, Slovenia was trying to do it in the past. I will cut it short, uh, not to, to, to take the, too much of the time. But uh, Slovenia is too small, to, really, to, to be a major player in, in Balkans. And we have been uh, uh, dealing with our own uh, problems. Uh, we are on the friendly terms with everybody there. And a lot of our expertise is there. So the governmental and non-governmental assistance to the to the uh, different stages of negotiation, preparation for negotiation, etc. But strategically, I don't think that Slovenia can play more a role than it is playing now. Mr. Kirchhoff? If I remember correctly, in 2004, it was in Greece, in Salonika, that uh, took place um, the first... Uh, 2003. 2003, the, yeah. first, the start of the enlargement of Europe to the Western Balkans. European so, perspective for the Western Balkans. Yes. So, um, yes, 2004 were the Olympics and everything <laughs> results on that. <laughs> so, uh, in my opinion, our position has not changed since. We are totally in favor of enlargement of the European Union for the Balkans. We want our neighbors to be in the European Union because we don't want to have borders with, count with countries but, uh, outside Mr. the yeah. Union. But we must not forget because it's not only the Western Balkans, it's also the Eastern Balkans, if we can say that for Turkey. Turkey, and to come back to the discussion, Turkey is, has, started, has started negotiations for so many years and we see that some things go forward and some things go backward. So it's not just the European perspective. The countries by themselves have to work hard to follow the rule of the law, the fundamental rights, the freedom of the press, the judicial integrity. Okay. So these are the rules. We are very help. We want to be very helpful, but uh, between our countries. And just uh, to mention that, not that I want to impose anything on anyone. The formal name of our northern um, country is the former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia. That's the UN name, okay. so I'm not using it. But okay. to, to go back to the question, yes, we really want these countries to get into the Union and we can do everything that passes through our hands except saying that one country has the name of one of our regions. Okay, good. The point is well made, Florian. I, I know that you wanted to enter into Maybe you can hold that thought for the next question. We're going to go round the table with a concluding thought um, on the Balkans as a whole. Just 30 seconds each. We'll start off with you. Um, uh, Mr. Kukan, um, what is the price of failure in the enlargement process or the engagement process um, with the Balkans? Just 30 seconds. What do we stand to lose if we get it wrong? Price will be very high, very difficult, because we want to speak about the 
Europe one and the whole, and without the integration of the Western Balkan countries, we cannot say that we achieved our goal uniting Europe. That would be a very big price. Okay, Florian? Yeah. Well, I think the, it's the, the enlargement has been the big success story of the European Union. It's been really, uh, you know, 2004, 2007, despite all of the shortcomings, it's been able to increase in size in numbers of countries, transform the countries with all the difficulties. And it would be a main disaster if basically the European Union would fail to complete this process and also basically step away from its success story. Um, and that I think is fundamental. And if the EU doesn't do it, somebody else will uh, have influence in that region. There is no such thing as an empty region. And that I think will be negative, not just for the countries of the Western Balkans, but for the European Union to have you know, seven small dictators uh, in the European Union's immediate surroundings with economic crisis can hardly be in the interest of the European Union. Yeah, how to stop the cheating or, each other, you know, yes. pretending that enlarge and uh, Balkans pretending that reform? Well, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, the process of enlargement is unavoidable. We, if you want a, a common Europe in, in, in the sense of a common market, but also the place of common values, etc., the enlargement should be finished with the inclusion of all European countries in European Union. The, the, the otherwise, there will be, as my friend Kuken said, a very, very high price to, to, to pay. We should not forget that enlargement and European integration is also a peace process and as such it should be seen also in the future. Okay. That is my idea too. The price that we will pay is the price of people, of our neighbours living in conditions and economically and in the domain of freedoms that are not uh, for a European um, a member of the European uh, yeah. geographic place. So the only way to move forward is through enlargement. The way we can do it is all already written. We have just to follow the steps. Thank you. Okay, th that's all we have time for. I, I, I'm afraid many thanks to our guests for joining us. Uh, Greek EMP Miltiadis Kirkos and Florian Bieber from the University of Graz. And Ivo Weigel from Slovenia and Edward Kukan from Slovakia. Many thanks indeed to everyone for joining us. And thanks too to you. Goodbye. Goodbye.